Thank you for joining me this morning for another Word in Season. I'm Pastor Stephanie, and it is my pleasure to be with you today, to share the Word of God with you. As we come together today, we just pray that the Lord God of Heaven will bless this Word unto our hearts and glorify His name. Let this Word, O oh God, bring light and life and understanding May grant revelation. May your word, O oh God, bring conviction to the hearts of your people and that we shall indeed be encouraged and drawn to you closer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's good to be here today again to share another word in season and I do pray that the word will bless your hearts today. Today, today we are picking up from where we left off last week and we are continuing on our journey through the book of Romans. Now, last week we spoke about the first topic which looked at the fact that we all need righteousness. Amen? And so we shared from chapters one one to three and we looked at the fact that man had a problem which was sin man had strayed from the presence of god and they were in need of redemption paul outlined in the gospel that the gospel had power to bring salvation and to redeem people to to bring us back to a right relationship with god and in other words for those who believed in jesus christ and accepted him as Lord and Savior. They were made righteous. Now he went on to explain in the last part of chapter 3 verse 21 to 33. That this righteousness was only possible by grace through faith. And this was available to anyone who would receive it. Anyone who would receive this gospel would indeed be justified made right in the presence of god and because it was a free gift this gift was the free gift of salvation and it was only to be received by faith so today we are going to pick up from where we left off and we're going to finish up with chapter three and then we will see what the lord will say to us today amen so let us read from chapter three and verse 27 down to 31 What is boasting then? It is excluded by, by what law? Nay, by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God, which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. So here, Paul continues his discourse and it is as if Paul is speaking to he, he expects his audience to respond to him. And so he's interacting with them in his own unique way. And so Paul is asking these, script, these questions to his reader about whether they believe that the law has been made redundant. But firstly, Paul says, you know, he establishes the fact that no one has any premises on which to boast about their salvation because this salvation was not something that we could earn through our works. We were, we were unable to earn salvation as a means of being good, as a means of being upright, as a means of being perfect in, 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 human, in human terms. Paul was explaining to them that what we have received is a free gift and so our redemption from sin was not something that any man could take any credit for because this was a free gift that was given to all 
by God through faith when we believed. The Jews may have been tempted to, to boast because they would say, well, we have a birthright as the Hebrews. We, 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 we read the Torah and we have been following the Mosaic law. But Paul cautioned them that this was not the case because God was very strategic. God ensured that there was a level playing field for everyone so that no person could boast that it is because of my social standing. It is because of what I have done or because God likes me more than you. And so God established that this salvation, the righteousness that was imputed to, to man was not because of any particular thing that we did except by grace through faith it was a free gift given unto us and so he was explaining this but paul went on to say no it's not as if faith has made the, the, the law nullified or void he was explaining to them that in fact because of faith or through faith the law was actually established and you see that in the last verse in verse 31. now paul went on to read further and to explain an example of Abraham, to use Abraham as an example to explain what he had just said. So the congregation in, in Rome were quite likely people like you and I, and they were very likely to be saying, but Paul, you don't know me. You don't know what I have. Paul, do you know about my credentials? Do you know that I'm this person's child? Do you know that I'm from this country? You can't say that my social standing in life doesn't give me any kudos or doesn't give me any brownie points with God. So Paul was preempting that question. And so he explained to them that Abraham's situation was not a, a special one because of who Abraham was, because he was thinking that they they might be you know saying that oh but we are Abraham's children we should we should get special points for being Abraham's children and he explained to them that not even Abraham had anything to boast about yes Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness and this is a this is a, this was recorded in Genesis 15 and verse 6 so Paul referred to the Old Testament and said I want to caution you. Abraham's justification, his righteousness was not based on anything he had done or just because he was particularly special. Abraham trusted in God's promise and believed that God would do what he said he would do. And that is the grounds on which Abraham was made righteous. And so Paul was encouraging the believers that the premise was set according to God's standards and not by Abraham's standard. Paul explained what I consider to be a paradigm shift here. The person who only worked or performed acts or rituals was considered to be indebted. And you may say, why? But Paul was saying works, works were not enough to gain a good standing with God. In fact, if you only just work and think, and thought that this was about to give you any brownie points or put you in a good position with God, your works alone was not enough. And in fact, the, because of your works, you were considered to be indebted. On the other hand, those who chose to believe, those who came to God in faith, by faith alone, without following all these rituals and exposing themselves to all these things, these are the people who were the ones who would be counted as righteous. And so God wanted to make it clear that he had a level playing field. Everyone could gain access into righteousness if they believed. And so because of people's personal attributes or their personal ability to do things, God wanted to make sure that that did not exclude some people. And so what he did, he made the playing field very level for everyone so that everyone was able to accomplish everyone was able to meet the standard and that the one standard was by faith by belief in Jesus Christ then everyone would be able to receive this free gift of God so given that righteousness 
could be obtained by faith alone, Paul expects that the next question that a reader would ask would be, would this righteousness be available to the uncircumcised? And Paul answers with a resounding yes. And here he even goes further to explain, using the example of Abraham again, how God had justified people with and without circumcision. So listen carefully to this. The righteousness that was signed and sealed for Abraham by circumcision had already been credited to him when he was still uncircumcised. Abraham's belief in God took place way before he was circumcised. And so his subsequent circumcision acted as a sign or a signature yeah, to his righteousness. And then it became a seal to verify that he was indeed righteous. So basically, we have a contract. So it's like going to make a contract or a covenant with someone. And when you go, you have written your name on the, the paper. You have completed the forms and you have, you've signed your signature at the bottom of it. That signature on that piece of paper indicates that you are in agreement that this you are in agreement with this contract and that you are a party to this contract the contract however becomes complete and becomes legal when it is registered with the relevant organization or if there's a seal that is placed upon it by a, a lawyer or a courthouse or a some kinds of some kind of organization that recognizes and and passes covenants as 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 legal and, and binding documents all right and so that seal that was placed upon that document now verifies that this covenant that was made is actually it's valid and it is enforceable so your signature to the covenant makes the covenant real but when it is sealed and it is registered with the government, then that verifies. If somebody came and asked, I need a copy of this, this covenant, they might question your signature. But when the seal of the government appears on it, they will say, yes, this is a valid copy of this covenant. And so what God did was when he caused, when he asked Abraham to become circumcised, then Abraham's circumcision was just a validation of the fact that Abraham was already righteous before God. Amen. And that covenant that was established between God and Abraham was also in, in, in respect to the land that God had promised to him. So this truth serves as a prototype for all believers, for both Jews and for Gentiles. For the Jews, it serves as a prototype because his circumcision pointed back to his justification. And for the Gentile, it, it is a prototype because Abraham received his righteousness before he was circumcised. And so what the Lord is saying here is that for those who were not born of, Jew, of Jewish descent, they also had a lively hope. You and I, if you are not from Jewish descent, he was also saying that this covenant that he made with Abraham, he, made, he was made righteous before God because of his faith. He was saying to everyone, to all the spiritual children of Abraham, that he would beget according to the book of Genesis, and I believe in chapter 17, God promised Abraham that he would make him the father of many nations and that God would be the Lord to his offspring and this precedence was already set. So God set a precedent of justification by faith. And so we who are not direct descendants of Abraham also are qualified and we have access to this justification by faith and not necessarily through circumcision. Amen. So Abraham was acquitted and declared righteous. When Jesus, the second Adam, died on the cross, for our sins he paid the ultimate penalty and so through faith in jesus christ and his righteousness then jesus's righteousness is imputed it means that it is passed on to us it is covered it has covered us it has been it has been superimposed or put upon us to to to, to cover over and in that way we are also acquitted and declared righteous by the righteous judge 
the one who is able to justify. So when Jesus died, the righteousness that Jesus Christ achieved through meeting and passing the requirements, he now was able to pass that on to us. And so because of Christ, we too can be justified. Now let's see what chapter 5 and verse 1 to 5 says as it goes on to explain how by faith we triumph in trouble. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And this implies that the hostility that was between God and believers has ceased because we have been reconciled to a right relationship or in right standing with God, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace or into the King's favor in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also boast in our suffering because we know that our suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character. Per character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which he has given unto us. Believers, we can boast in the sure expectation of the glory of God, his divine presence and his power because of our confidence that comes through the Holy Spirit who is now residing in our hearts. So earlier on, Paul said to the people, no, you can't boast. You cannot boast about receiving this righteousness. You cannot boast about your position in God because you did not achieve it on your own. But then now he goes back to say, now you can boast because of your suffering. You know, this Paul is someone is, I really admire the way Paul writes because he uses what we call paradigms. He will give you this, the same thing, but then he will flip it and, 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 and show you the other side of it. So now he's saying we can actually glory, we can boast in the sufferings that we attain through Christ. When you are persecuted, when you are humiliated because of your belief in Christ, when you are ostracized and marginalized because you trust God. Paul was saying this is where you can actually boast. You can boast that because of Christ you can suffer. And he, and he said that your suffering was not in vain because the suffering produces perseverance. It, it produces in us that ability to overcome, that ability to go on in spite of. And when, this, when this, this perseverance or what I would call resilience is built in us, then it forms our character, that character of godliness that allows us to stand and having done all to stand in spite of the circumstances. And when that character is built in you, that character that says that I will continue to run, I will maintain my position in God, then that character produces hope. And this hope does not make us ashamed because there is a reason for our hope. And our hope is that Jesus Christ is coming again and Jesus will produce for us he will help us, he will sustain us through the power of the Holy Spirit, which he has given to us today. And he will continue to give to those who will receive him. Amen and praise the Lord. So as you are listening to me today, you might be thinking, so how do I participate? How do I access this this righteousness, how am I made justified? How can I be justified? How may I access this redemption that was purchased for me? So Romans chapter five and verse 12 explains, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all have sinned. Verse 15 says, but the gift is not like the trespass, for if many died, by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Verse 18, consequently, just as one trespass resulted in, the in condemnation for all people, so also this one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. Verse 19 says, for just as through disobedience of the one man, the many were all made sinners. So also through the obedience of the one man, 
all may may be made righteous verse 20 says the law was brought in so that the trespass might increase but where sin increase grace even more so increase so that just as sin reigned in death so also great grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through jesus christ our lord in a nutshell is that when adam sinned every other human being that sin was imputed it was passed on to everybody else but the sinless man came and paid the penalty the penalty for sin was death and so jesus christ a sinless man the son of god he came and paid that penalty and so by extension his righteousness imputed was imputed unto us and so just as one man's sin made everyone guilty so one man's righteousness made everyone right with god and that is how we are able to gain this righteousness today this is a promise that we have today if we as sinners would believe that jesus christ has paid the penalty for our sins then god is ready to change the verdict he is ready to turn his attitudes towards us and restore and reconcile us to a right relationship with him and that is to make us right to make us righteous and so that we can be glorified with him i would love to invite you to participate and to take advantage of this offer this free gift that god has provided god has changed my life and that is why i can offer you this promise god has the ability to trans people transform people from hopelessness from a position of of dying in our sins god is inviting someone today to take up this offer it is a free gift and you do not need to do anything except to believe that jesus christ is the son of god and that he has paid the penalty for your sins and so that you can be reconciled to god if you believe this, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he has purchased your salvation with his blood and that he has risen and is seated at the right hand of God the Father and is able to impute, to pass on his righteousness to you, then I invite you to say this prayer with me today. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you today I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he has died to save me from my sins. I now repent and confess my sins and I ask that you will wash me and make me clean. Receive me into your family, O oh God, and help me to walk with you for the rest of my life. I receive you now, Lord Jesus, as my Lord and Savior, as I pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have said that prayer today, you have been made right with God. It is the beginning of a journey of a lifetime. And it is the beginning of a great journey, a great process of growing in the grace of God and in the in knowledge of who he is. To grow in God, you will need to learn the, his instructions that he has given us through his guidebook that we call the Bible. The Bible will show you how you are able to walk with the Lord to, to become more like him each day. And so I encourage you to go and read the Bible. Start in the Holy Scriptures. I suggest you start reading at St. John and see how God sent his son and how his plan of salvation was for you. I do encourage you to continue to grow and to find a Bible-believing church where you can be nurtured as you grow in your faith with God. If you need assistance with that, I am happy for you to reach out to me with a drop in a comment here or by email to stephjewelsmusic at gmail.com. And I would be more than happy to help you find a church and another group of believers to encourage you in your walk with the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to share this word and for the opportunity, O oh God, to be reminded about who you are and the great 
plan of salvation that you have for us. We thank you for those who have accepted the, answered the call today, those who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and have pledged to continue to walk with him. May you seal their faith and may you seal their position in the kingdom of God. Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus that as this word continues to go forth, that it will locate those who need to hear it and that it will transform us from glory to glory. Lord, we pray that you will continue to bless your word unto our hearts and glorify your name as we continue to walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Thank you for joining us today. Next week, we will continue with our journey through the book of Romans as the Holy Spirit leads us through this really beautiful epistle that is essential for all believers. We do hope that you will join us again. And if you have missed the earlier versions of this Word in Season, we've been studying the book of Romans over the last two weeks, and we do hope that you will catch up on the earlier versions and some of the earlier topics that we have discussed. So God bless you, and I do hope to meet you here next week again. So stay blessed, and I leave the shalom of God with you. Bye-bye for now.